Well, when last we looked at Judges chapter 14, verses 10 through 20, we saw Samson follow through with his ill-advised idea of marrying a Philistine unbeliever. A further compromise turned their week-long wedding reception into a Nazarite forbidden drinking party. And in the midst of the drinking, there was also a bad bet, which under threat turned Samson's brand new wife against him. And yet, the Holy Spirit intervenes to turn things in a righteous direction by having Samson kill 30 Philistine soldiers who were wrongly oppressing Israel. But in further violation of his Nazarite vow, Samson strips the gear off of their dead bodies in order to pay his bet and avoid financial ruin. <clears throat> Samson is also still angry with his new wife, and he goes home without her. However, this leads to a very crazy twist that Samson's new father-in-law decides to give Samson's wife in marriage to one of the 30 men that Samson just paid off. One of the same men who also threatened Samson's wife and his father-in-law with death should they not get the answer to Samson's riddle. To make matters worse, Samson's father-in-law does this without an official annulment or divorce from Samson. And so God is showing us that the Philistines here are an amoral people who must be judged. And therefore, Samson, as God's special instrument, must act. And with that, we come to our text today. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Judges chapter 15. We're going to look at verse, verse 1 through the first part of verse 8. I will go ahead and read all of verse 8, but... I will not cover the end of verse 8 today, uh, but Judges chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Let us see what God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant word has to say to us here this morning. Judges chapter 15, verse 1 through the first part of verse 8. Let's read it together. It says, After a while... In the time of the wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. And he said, let, let me go into my wife, into her room. But her father would not permit him to go in. Her father said, I really thought you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Then Samson went and caught 300 foxes. And he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails. When he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyards and olive groves. Then the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, Since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you. And after that, I will cease. So he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Atom. This is the word of our Lord through the prophet Samuel. 
Well, as we begin here in Judges chapter 15, verse 1, we see this phrase, after a while, in the time of the wheat harvest. But how long has this been since the time of Samson's wedding? Well, because ancient Israel was a heavily agricultural society, uh, and different harvests dominated large parts of the calendar year, most weddings in ancient Israel were held after the final harvest of the year was over, and that was the olive harvest. And interestingly enough, the olive harvest typically ended in the middle of October, which we are just so happen to be in right now. So that being the case, there is a very high probability that Samson got married at the end of October. That was the tradition of Jews in the ancient world, to get married around that time. The wheat harvest, though, in Israel, that lasts from the end of May to the first part of June. And therefore, in this case, Judges 15.1, this phrase here, after a while, in, in this particular case, again, we're looking at over a half a year, over half of a year later. And in anger over her betrayal, Samson has stayed away from his brand new wife for several months. Not a good idea, let me just say. Now I'll admit, Julie can attest to this. When Julie gets angry with me, I also have a tendency to stay away, don't I, unfortunately. But that only makes things worse. That only makes things worse. It is much, much, much better to work out conflict in your marriage rather than avoid it. Uh, reconciliation is important in any relationship, but I, I am very thankful for Julie in that usually she doesn't stay angry very long, and that makes it easier for me. So yay, uh, appreciate that. But uh, resolve conflict in marriage uh, and do so quickly. That's very, very important. Samson doesn't do that, so learn from his mistake. But other than his marital conflict, there's another possible reason why Samson stayed away for so long. Again, looks like a half a year, maybe more. Samson may have been waiting for a good time to come back when the 30 men who gave him so much trouble at his wedding wouldn't be around. The wheat harvest would have demanded that, that those 30 men be in the fields working. And so Samson goes back to Timnah, goes back to where his wife lives in hopes that the men who gave him a hard time wouldn't be in town at the time. Now, Samson also brings along a young goat as a gift for his wife. Now, that's interesting because we've seen young goats before, haven't we? Yes, earlier in the book of Judges, we saw that Gideon and Samson's father Manoah each offer a young goat to who? The angel of the Lord. Uh, now, why did they do this? Well, at the time, Gideon and Manoah didn't realize who they were dealing with. They didn't realize that they were actually talking to God, appearing as an angel. Um, and so they didn't even realize that they were talking to anything supernatural at all. They thought it might be just a normal human being. And back in those days, all meat, all meat was a delicacy. Uh, goat meat was the most common, but meat from a young goat was more tender and thus more prized. And therefore... Uh, it's interesting, Robert Balling, he looks at this young goat that Samson brings to his wife here, and he says, that's basically like guys today bringing their wife or their girlfriend a box of chocolates. I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have thought about it that way, but okay, I guess so. I, uh, that's kind of what it was like, bringing, a, bringing a, your significant other a, a young goat was like bringing them a box of chocolates. I'm like, okay, well, I think chocolates are better, but you know, eh, eh, whatever works. But if Samson thinks that this gift to his wife is just going to magically make up for his multi-month-long absence <laughs> and their conflict, 
and then immediately lead to the level of intimacy that he's hoping for? <laughs> Samson thinks all of those things. He's foolish. He's foolish. There's not only a lot to work out. Samson is about to discover that in reality, things will never be worked out here in his marriage. Because at the end of verse 1, going into verse 2, Samson's father-in-law stops Samson from entering his wife's room because even though, again, Samson never got their marriage annulled, he never tried to get a divorce, never did any of that stuff, she already married another man. And the person, the man that she married, is again one of those 30 companions back in chapter 14. Now, some translations even say that this man was Samson's friend. That's a little bit too generous of a reading, uh, seeing as Judges 14.11 indicates that this man and the 29 others who were with him were more or less just assigned to accompany <laughs> Samson during the wedding and even act as guards should Samson turn against them. And, and furthermore, again, the fact that this man joined the others in actually threatening Samson's wife before marrying her after Samson left shows that this guy is far from a real friend. He's, he's not a real friend. He's just a companion, and he's a companion for show. Of course, the question is, why? Why does Samson's father-in-law give Samson's wife to this man, of all people? Well, the excuse that Samson's father-in-law gives is that he really thought that Samson thoroughly hated her. Now, given the many months that have passed and the vulnerability of unmarried women in the ancient world, we might understand this excuse. We're not for a couple of reasons. There's a couple of things that make us think, eh, you're not being genuine when you say that. Because this father remarried his daughter to one of the men who just threatened his life and the life of his daughter. So what are you thinking, man? And if he really thought that Samson meant to annul the marriage, he should have returned the dowry, but didn't. And so this Philistine father-in-law is actually even more foolish here than Samson. But he tries to cover it all up by offering Samson the younger sister whom the father says in the Hebrew literally that she's even prettier. <laughs> wow. Did you catch that? A dad saying this about his own daughters. That, you know, the younger one's even prettier. Uh, this guy is far from getting the world's best dad award. Okay, let, let's establish that right now. To add to his missteps, though, because it doesn't stop there. This, this guy really is crazy. To add to his missteps, Leviticus 18.18 18 forbids a man from marrying their wife's sister while the other is still alive. Even if they got a divorce or whatever, uh, Leviticus 18.18 18 forbids a man from ever marrying his wife's sister while the, the other is still alive. However, Leviticus 18.3 says that this was a known practice among the Egyptians, among the Canaanites, but yet it should not be done. Now, why did God say this? Well, among other reasons, and there's more than I could get into, and I, I just won't because I think it's pretty obvious why, but among other reasons, God gave this law to prevent creating an unnecessary rivalry among sisters. Uh, that makes sense. There's other reasons as well. Now, Samson's credit, Samson does make his fair share of mistakes, but he actually does something good and right here. To his credit, instead of taking this advice, marrying the so-called younger, prettier sister, he actually honors God's word here by not marrying the wife's sister. But what can we learn from all of this? Well, when it comes to marriage, or anything else for that matter, one of the things we can learn is that it's really, really, really important to do things God's way. 
it's very important to do things God's way. Uh, the world, let's be honest, the world acts that God's way is what? It's restrictive. And, and because it's restrictive, because God gives all these rules and says, you can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, that's bad. God is just a cosmic killjoy. But here's what the world forgets when it says that. The world forgets that restrictions are good when what? Restrictions are good when they prevent unnecessary harm. Restrictions are good in that case. So let's just look at marriage, for example, since that's what we're talking about. When you don't pursue marriage God's way, you're asking for trouble. There are consequences, natural consequences, for not doing things God's way. And another thing you and I should note about this is, again, that while Samson is guilty of several missteps thus far, we must remember that according to Hebrews 11.32, he is a man of faith. And as a man of faith, Samson must know God's word. And therefore, when he sins, you can't say he does so out of ignorance. No, you can't do that. Uh, when Samson, for example, showed humility by not telling anyone about how he killed a lion with his bare hands, that shows a knowledge of God's word. He knows what God's word says about humility. When Samson doesn't marry his wife's sister here, even though that was perfectly acceptable for the Philistines, that shows a level of knowledge of God's word. Samson knows that's not right. I shouldn't do that. And of course, when we consider these things, we also have to ask the question, does your life show a knowledge of God's word? Yes, it's obvious that no one outside of Jesus Christ is perfect. I'm not perfect. But it's equally obvious that despite whatever weaknesses do you have, does your life show that you have faith in Jesus? Because really that's how our witness is going to win people over. Samson isn't a perfect man, but he does have his positive God-honoring moments which I think some dismiss too quickly in the face of his flaws. Um, do you show, despite your imperfections, that you know God's word and that you really do seek to love and to cherish Jesus Christ? That's a challenge for all of us. Now, speaking of flaws, besides his weakness for women, Samson has at least one other big thing he struggles with. We, we all have things that we struggle with, every single one of us. And some of those things that we struggle with, maybe our neighbor doesn't struggle with that, but we do. And maybe our neighbor struggles with something that we don't really struggle with, but they really do. We all have our own weaknesses, and we need to keep that in mind uh, and, and not be uh, too uh, not understanding, okay? We need to, when, when, when we're talking with somebody and, and they're dealing with certain weaknesses and we're maybe tempted to really get on their case, remember how much you struggle with your weaknesses and that will give you a little bit more compassion. Samson has a weakness for women. That's pretty clear. There's one other big thing that he also struggles with, though. We see it here in this text. What does Samson also struggle with besides women? He struggles with vengeance. He really, really struggles with vengeance. When somebody does something bad to him, boy, he really just wants to dish it right back. He struggles with vengeance. Maybe you do too. Now in Deuteronomy 32, 25, what does the Lord say, though, about vengeance? This is something that Samson should know. This is something that we all should know. What does God say about vengeance? In Deuteronomy 32, 25, the Lord says what? Vengeance is mine. But Samson often lives as if God said vengeance is fine. That's a problem. 
That's a problem. Indeed, Samson tells his father-in-law, and perhaps the whole town, in Judges 15, 3, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. He says this in response to his wife being married off to another man without him dissolving their marriage. Uh, so he seeks to get vengeance. And, and this leads to what is probably Samson's least discussed feat of strength. It's very, it's very interesting. I find this one very interesting. But it's, uh, you don't find much discussion about it. Uh, in, in Judges 15, 4 through 5, Samson catches 300 foxes. Uh, the Hebrew word here can actually mean foxes or jackals, and we're not really sure uh, which one is meant because uh, both of those animals, along with hyenas and wolves, still live in Israel to this day. So we're not sure if it's foxes or jackals, uh, but it's one of them. Uh, we're also told, we're not told, how Samson catches these foxes or jackals. The Hebrew word for caught does allow for the use of traps, but if, if any of y'all have ever tried to trap animals, skunks, or whatever, and, and, and many of us have, we live in Texas after all, um, but uh, if you were using traps, if you catch 300, it would take a lot of traps, uh, and it would also probably take a lot of time. But the Hebrew indicates that this didn't take a lot of time. Um, uh, Daniel Block notes that there's a quick succession of Hebrew verbs here that are just <coughs> one right after the other after the other, uh, the verbs being went, caught, took, turned, put, set, sent, and burned. And they're all really close to each other. All these verbs. And, and all of these verbs in the Hebrew language being very close to each other suggest this all happened very quickly. Uh, that this hardly took Samson any time at all to catch these 300 animals. Of course, another question that might come up is, well, why, why 300? Uh, I mean, that's a lot, but, but why does Samson catch 300 animals? Probably as an homage to Gideon and his 300 men. Uh, Samson is, is a bit unique when it comes to most of Israel's other judges, not all of them, but Compared to most of Israel's other judges, Samson is a bit unique in the fact that unlike most of Israel's other judges, they lead an army. Not a big one, a little one, like Gideon 300. Samson never leads an army. Uh, he, he is an army of one, quite literally. Uh, but uh, as an homage, you know, paying respect to Gideon, he's like, I'll get my army of foxes. Uh, and so he gets 300 foxes. Uh, and, and we see more evidence of the fact that Samson is an army all by himself. He is so strong, he doesn't really need a human army because um, not only is Samson able to, again, according to the quick succession of Hebrew verbs, quickly catch these 300 animals, he's able to tie individual torches between the tails of each one. And, I mean, you just think about that for just a second. Think about that for a second. This shows a remarkable level of not only strength, but speed and dexterity. Um, the, the text indicates that Samson quite literally manhandles these animals without them giving him any trouble not anything he can't handle anyway, and he does this without the use of modern tranquilizers. Um, that's kind of crazy. Um, now, especially, and you know, I think back at my own life, uh, as many of you know, I was born and raised on a dairy farm. We had a lot of barn cats. Some of them were tame, the ones we owned, and then we inherited a bunch. You know, just wild ones come, you know, because you got things there on dairy farms that cats like. So, um, so, but sometimes, you know, we'd have these, these wild cats and, and wild barn cats, and, and I would try to catch them to either tame them myself or to give them to other people for them to tame. But uh, I would always do it one at a time. I'm not trying to catch, you know, 300 at once here. 
But, it's, but you know, I, I'd, be, I'd have to be very patient, you know, I'd kind of wait for my moment. Usually food would be the key. Food is always the key when it comes to these things, is with traps too. Um, uh, animals will do, make a lot of questionable decisions in pursuit of food. Uh, so uh, that's just, a, we all know this, is if you're a hunter, you know that. But um, uh, so I, I would catch them, catch them one at a time, but by catching these wild cats, I'd always get my wrist torn up, like every single time, because they, they, they scratch, you know. So, uh, so uh, you know, I, I think about just trying to catch a barn cat, and Samson is catching foxes or jackals. It's like, oh my goodness, for him to be able to catch these guys, tie a torch between their tails and go, my goodness, how strong and fast was this guy? A lot stronger and a lot faster than I think any of us really realize. Um, uh, because what Samson does here is extremely impressive. I, I, I don't, I'll even say this. What Samson does here is I don't think it's repeatable. I, I don't think anybody today could do this without using modern technology, tranquilizers, or something like that. I, I really don't think anybody could repeat this. This is, this is really kind of an amazing feat of strength, speed, and dexterity. <laughs> And yet it shows, I think, what the Holy Spirit can do through Samson. Uh, uh, but then, of course, there's another question here. Okay, Samson did all this by the power of the Holy Spirit, obviously. But why does he tie torches between the tails of every two? It's because if you just tied a torch, and, and, and I've even uh, looked at movies and plays that kind of, you know, prepare. Uh, portray the life of Samson just to kind of get in my head how other people have looked at this. And, and I know one of the portrayals I looked at, uh, the they had the torch tied to just one tail of one fox, and then the fox would go, when that's not what the Bible says. Uh, and, and there's a reason why Samson didn't do it that way, even though that would have been easier. It's because if a jackal or a fox just takes off running by itself, not another one tied to it. Foxes and jackals can run pretty fast. I mean, look at 40 miles an hour at least. Um, and at, at those fast running speeds, it could probably snuff out the torch as it was going. But since it was tied between two of them by their tails, and they're each running the opposite direction, they're yanking each other in the opposite direction, what's that going to do? It's going to slow them down, first of all. And then it's also going to uh, make them move around erratically, okay? They're not going to be running in a straight line, not trying to jump in their den, you know, or anything like that. They're going to be very erratic because one's pulling the other. They're going to be very erratic. And so for Samson's purpose, this would create both more burn time because they're not going fast enough to snuff out the torch. And then as they're moving around randomly, they're starting fires in random places. Uh, and so they're getting both the standing grain, they're getting the already harvested grain, they're getting the grape vineyards, they're getting the olive groves, just like the text says, they're burning everything. It's very erratic and it's all over. And this, plus the fact that the wheat harvest is usually a very dry time of the year in Israel, it only contributes to Samson's successes. Not only is the Philistines' wheat harvest ruined, so is their upcoming grape and olive harvests. And therefore, it's no surprise that in Judges 15, 6, the day after all of this happens, the Philistines want to know, who's responsible for this? Who did this? You have messed us up for the whole year. Samson is identified as the culprit. But surprisingly, he's given an excuse. Samson only destroyed the Philistines' harvest because his father-in-law gave his wife to another man. And so instead of the Philistines seeking vengeance upon Samson, they seek vengeance by burning Samson's wife and father-in-law to death instead. And so it's, it's, it's kind of ironic. 
the very thing, remember, what was Samson's wife trying to avoid back in chapter 14 when she nagged Samson to get him to spill the answer to his riddle? They had threatened her life. They had threatened her father's life. They said that they would burn them alive to, in, in their father's house and kill them. So she nags Samson and gets the answer, and Samson loses his bet. But that's the reason why. She, she, she betrays her own husband to, to avoid being burned to death. And look at what happens. She gets burned to death anyway. Um, it's, it's both tragic and curious. But because you, you got to be wondering, why, why would the Philistines punish Samson's wife and father-in-law when they were both Philistines? And Samson's an Israelite. And he's the one who actually burned the harvest. Uh, well, more than likely, the Philistines had come to fear Samson ever since he killed 30 of their own soldiers single-handedly back in Judges 14, 19. And so at this point, the Philistines are a little too scared to mess with Samson. Like, boy, do you hear how he took out 30 guys? 30 soldiers! Fully armed, by the way! By himself. Did you hear about that? Who wants to go fight him? And everybody's like, not me. You know, I don't, I don't want to do that. That doesn't sound like fun. And so they go after his wife and father-in-law instead. But Samson is greatly offended by these murders. And so he vows vengeance. And again, that's the way Samson is. He, he's Vengeance is fine, he acts like, when it's vengeance is mine. Uh, he vows vengeance in Judges 15, 7 through 8. And the text tells us that Samson attacked the Philistines hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Uh, in fact, the, the language here, the hip and thigh thing, that recalls what Samson did to the lion back in Judges 14, 6. What did Samson do to the lion? Obviously, he killed him. But in Hebrew, it's very clear. He not, he not only killed this lion, he tore it apart. Tore the jaw off. Tore the legs off. He dismembered it. Tore it apart. And he does the same thing again. He fights these Philistines, and he kills some of them. But as he doesn't just kill them. He literally tears them limb from limb. It's just, again, it's a frightening level of strength that this guy has. He's much stronger than probably any of us ever realized. Again, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But this guy could really do some damage. Uh, and the words great slaughter that are used here indicates he did this to quite a few. How many? We don't know. Probably more than the 30 he killed earlier, but probably less than the 1,000. That we'll get to uh, later. But uh, uh, the, the fact that Samson is not only able to take on a multitude and win, but to do so while actually tearing his opponent's appendages off shows just how crazy strong he is. That, that through Samson, God is not only hindering the Philistines' ability to enslave Israel, he's actually making them afraid. To do so, he's making them think twice. And yet, for Samson's part, he doesn't appear motivated when he's fighting. He doesn't appear to be motivated by fighting for Israel's freedom from slavery. I I would hope that you know, if I was in his shoes, that that would be what would motivate me. I'm fighting to free my people who are enslaved because that's what's going on. But that's not what Samson is thinking when he does this. When, when he does these things, he is acting upon vengeance. That, that, that's his motivation. And, and after getting his vengeance, look at what Judges 15, 7 indicates. After getting his vengeance, it says that Samson is, is, is more than willing to stop. That, that he's just concerned about himself and, and getting his own vengeance, making things even. And... and, and and there's a lot that we can learn from this because this is the difference between vengeance and justice. 
And that's a question that we still struggle with here in our day and age. What's the difference between vengeance and justice? There is a difference, but what is it? Samson has lost what the difference is, but we can't. We can't. So what is the difference? Well, justice seeks what's right in God's sight without partiality, okay? And therefore, when true justice is done, you can't really have any legitimate complaints or legitimate, resp or, or legitimate responses. Yeah, you might still get some people who complain. Yeah, you might still get some people who say, that shouldn't have never happened. But at the end of the day, everyone knows what's right in God's sight happened, and it happened without partiality. Um, and, and, and therefore, you might still have some people complain, but they don't really have a leg to stand on, okay? Vengeance, on the other hand, is different. Vengeance is simply the settlement of a grudge, which removed from God's universal righteous standard is dangerously repeatable. Let me say that again. Vengeance, well, first I'll say justice. Justice seeks what's right in God's sight without partiality. Okay, that's justice. Vengeance is the settlement of a grudge removed from God's universal righteous standard and is therefore dangerously repeatable. Okay? If you seek vengeance for your own sake, you are more, it's more than likely that the other party will also seek vengeance on you, which what? Creates a vicious cycle, right? And therefore, this is why only God, who is perfectly righteous, can seek vengeance. Uh, only God ordained governments can fight for justice. While the church has a responsibility to extend God's grace, and forgiveness. So we all have our role. God, only God can seek vengeance because only God is perfect, okay? We're not. We're not going to seek vengeance in a completely holy way, but God can. The government, which is ordained by God, they can seek justice. The reason why governments exist, according to Romans chapter 7, is to fight for justice. The church, we have a different role. We do not seek vengeance like God. We do not seek justice like the government. We seek grace. We seek forgiveness. That's our role, okay? The point is, we all have our role, okay? And if we all stay in our lanes, if we all stay in our own lane, everything's good. So when we get out of our lane, when things start to fall apart. And so, what should be happening here in this text? With all that in mind, Samson is what? He's ordained by God to be Israel's judge. He is the government who's supposed to be providing justice. That's, that's what he's supposed to be doing. And thus, he has a right. Samson has a right from God to fight the Philistines, but to do so in terms of not of vengeance, but of justice. Because they have enslaved the Israelites. So in terms of justice, Samson has a role. And God is accomplishing justice through Samson's actions. But in Samson's own mind, and this is the problem, in his own mind, he's not rightly motivated by justice. He's wrongly motivated by personal vengeance. And thus Samson is engaging in dangerously cyclical behavior. He thinks he can fight for what's right in his own eyes and then stop. And then stop. But if it's all about subjective opinions instead of God's standard of right and wrong, what's to stop the Philistines from fighting back? What's to stop them? And the answer is nothing. Nothing. And, and like the, the evil empire in Star Wars, the Philistines will strike back. But I will wait and get 
to give you that until next week. But in the meantime, let us remind ourselves of the lessons in this text. Uh, only seek marriage as God defines it. If you do otherwise, it will only be to your own detriment. Once you are married, seek to resolve conflicts quickly. Pursue reconciliation. Don't let things fester. It's why Ephesians 4.26 says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger. In every situation, not just marriage, but in every situation, seek to apply the knowledge of God's word to your life. And when you're tempted to seek vengeance, and we all are, I know I am, let God take care of it through his means. He has means. He has the government to seek justice. And then, of course, he will make sure that in the end, everything is set right. You yourself, as a member of the Christian church, show forgiveness and grace. Because forgiveness is great, and grace is what Jesus Christ gave you. So let us remember these things and pray. Lord Jesus.